the Q&A session. So tonight's topic, we're, um, we're talking about dark energy, continuing our journey to the dark side of the universe. Before we get started, tonight's talk is in memory of Winnie Dean Drain, who passed away on July the 22nd, 2013. And she is, of course, the mother-in-law of our very own, Bill Bustler. And she will be missed. You can see that she lived a full life. And we have no doubt that she is in a place right now where she will be able to better contemplate the mysteries of the universe. So, Winnie, this talk is for you tonight. Thank you. So, in the time it takes me to speak one sentence of this presentation, the volume of the universe will have expanded by 14 trillion cubic light years. There's a weird repulsive energy that's causing space in the universe. We've known about it for a while, but what we haven't known until recently is that the, the rate of expansion of the universe is accelerating with time. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So getting back to our pie chart, you can see the mass energy content in the universe. 73% is composed of this weird, what we call dark energy, that's very, that's very mysterious to us. We don't understand very much about it. It's, uh, it's something that we scientists have, um, have recently discovered. Of course, last time we talked about dark matter, the 23% right here, dark matter being what we think is a new type of particle called a WIMP, a weakly interacting massive particle. And it hasn't been detected yet. There are multiple experiments going on in laboratories right now to try and find WIMPs. And this has been going on for the better part of a decade right now. And uh, dark matter and dark energy combined constitute 96% of the universe. The other 4% right here is what we call or ordinary baryonic matter, the atoms and molecules that make up our bodies. Everything in this room, the photons of light that we see, both in the, the lights in this room as well as the stars, planets, galaxies, everything. Of that 4%, 10% of the 4% or 0.4% is everything that you and I experience every day. Okay? So, the 3.6% of the ordinary matter in the universe is either intergalactic gas or supermassive black holes. So, we are the leftovers of the universe. You think you're small? You're very small. 96% is stuff that we don't know about. So we talked about the 23% last time. We're going to talk about the 73% right now. So in this talk, we're going to be talking about the expanding universe and the rate of deceleration. What does that mean? If the universe is expanding, the idea is that the rate of expansion should be slowing with time due to gravity. However, we're going to talk about empirical evidence for the acceleration of the universe. Counterintuitive. Dark energy possibilities. What is it? What are some of the candidates for dark energy? And finally, the ultimate fate of the universe. Let's take a little history lesson here. Okay, We're going to go back to the 1920s. Cosmology is a new science. It's a subset of astronomy that deals with the origin of the universe, the universe as a whole, the expansion of the universe, some of the grander questions, the bigger questions, how we got here, where we're going, and what's going on. So cosmology really began about 90 years ago. In the 1920s, the perception of the universe was the Milky Way galaxy. In 1919, Einstein's general theory of relativity had just been proven. So Einstein worked on this for a decade and a half, basically going back to Newtonian gravity, picking it apart and discovering intuitively through thought experiment that gravity is not a force, but it's a curvature of space and time due to the presence of matter. So think of the universe as a rubber sheet. And matter bends the fabric of space and time. That's why objects fall. What's interesting is Newton didn't understand this. Brilliant man. We still use Newtonian mathematics today in physics when we're designing things. But Newton kind of threw his hands up when he was doing gravity. He didn't understand what it was. So he invented something called the universal gravitational constant, or big G, that kind of balances equations in his way of saying, well, I don't really know what gravity is, so I'm just going to invent this formula and go from there. And Newton himself was really not satisfied with that result. Einstein comes along 250 years later and solves gravity. And it was proven to be correct in 1919. Total solar eclipse, the moon blocks the photosphere of the sun. You can see behind the sun 
starlight that's being bent by the gravity of the sun. So the discovery and the proof of general relativity took us a leap forward in our understanding of exactly what the universe was. However, Einstein himself, his worldview, kept him trapped in this myopic view of the universe as being static and eternal. So the universe was the Milky Way, the galaxies are fixed in their positions on the sky, it's static, it's eternal, it always existed, it never had a beginning, it will never have an end. That was kind of our perception in the 1920s. And Einstein was not comfortable with a dynamic universe. So he had, but he had a problem. Einstein had a problem. His equations of general relativity wouldn't balance. Think about it logically. If you have all the galaxies in the universe sitting out there, they have mass. Mass creates a gravitational field, so the, galaxy, the galaxies should be pulling on each other, and the universe should contract due to gravity. So Einstein tried to resolve this, but he couldn't get his equations of general relativity to balance. So what he did is he invented something called the cosmological constant, or the Greek letter lambda. Very important for tonight's talk. Put the, put the Greek letter lambda into your mind. Cosmological constant is kind of an anti-gravity to balance out the effects of gravity so that the universe wouldn't crush itself back to a singularity, but would actually hold the universe constant. And this was Einstein's way of doing what Newton did, just kind of throwing his hands up and saying, well, I don't really know what the solution is, so I'm going to invent something called the cosmological constant to balance gravity, hold the universe static, I'm happy, let's go from here. However, logically this doesn't really work either. But Einstein was onto something here that later would turn out to be one of the greatest discoveries in science. Cosmological constant, anti-gravity, perfectly balanced the effects of gravity to keep the universe static. A little later, a man named George Lemaitre came along. And Lemaitre was a Belgian priest, but he kind of looked at Einstein's general theory of relativity and his equations objectively. Einstein was biased by his worldview of a static universe. Lemaitre wasn't. So here you see a young George Lemaitre and an older Albert Einstein. And Lemaitre was one of the first scientists to propose that the universe was born, that had a beginning. And this was sort of, it sort of rocked the scientific world because people didn't want to believe that. But Lemaitre, in 27, I believe, published a paper about the origin of the universe, and he went and dug into Einstein's equations of general relativity and was able to show a logical scenario for the expansion of the universe. Einstein didn't like it, and here you can see Einstein chastising George Lemaitre and basically saying, you know, your math is correct, your calculations are correct, but your physics is atrocious. Him saying, I don't agree with this philosophy or of your perception of an expanding universe. And then Hubble came along at the end of the 1920s. In 1929, of course, in 1925, we talked about this in our last talk, Hubble was the man who expanded the universe by a factor of 100 billion. At that time, the Milky Way galaxy was the universe in the minds of people. There were these little fuzzy patches in people's telescopes when they looked at the universe. We call them nebula, the Andromeda nebula, or the Andromeda spiral. Hubble analyzed something called Cepheid variables, which could be used as a type of standard candle to determine the distance to these nebula and determine that they were not part of our Milky Way galaxy. They were actually much, much further away. And he was the one who discovered that there were extra galaxies beyond our Milky Way. We call them island universes, Immanuel Kant. But in addition to that, four years later in 1929, Hubble was the one who did empirical observations of the redshift of distant galaxies. And he discovered something called the Hubble constant, which is the rate at which galaxies are moving away. And what he discovered was that the greater the distance of a galaxy from our location or from any other galaxy in the universe, in other words, the more space that there was between one galaxy and another, the faster that galaxy was actually moving away. So expansion was directly proportional to the distance between two galaxies. And it's called Hubble's Law. 
Mathematically, it's pretty simple. V is equal to H naught D. H naught is another number you're going to want to put into your brain in addition to lambda. It's called the Hubble constant. And Hubble did an, an analysis of 46 galaxies and their redshift. And he was able to calculate a value of H naught equal to 500 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Uh, a megaparsec is a million parsecs. A parsec is 3.26 light years. So it's roughly 3 million light years. So that value right there, and then the D is the proper distance from one galaxy to another. It's a function of time because the universe is expanding, which means that D is changing with respect to time. We're not going to get into the detailed mathematics tonight. I'm going to try and keep things simple. But if you did a time derivative of this, you could actually develop something called the robertson lemaitre frederick walker equation, which is the equation for the expansion of the universe. Anyway, forget about all that. This is what's important right here. See this plot right here? It's called the Hubble plot. And he did an analysis of distant galaxies and plotted them on a scatter plot. And what he discovered was an upward trend on this plot, which showed that as the distance given by the, plot, the x-axis here, as that increases, the velocity, which is the y-axis here, is also increasing. So there's a linear relationship between the distance of a galaxy from us and its rate of, ex of expansion away from us. So Hubble discovered that the universe was, excel was um, expanding and that it was expanding more and more quickly with time depending on the distance between the galaxies. And that's what's meant by Hubble's law. So upward diagonal, expanding universe. If the line was straight, we would have a, a static constant universe. So after Hubble came along, Einstein goes back to his cosmological constant, rethinks the whole idea, and discover and comes to the conclusion that it was his biggest blunder. He should never have introduced lambda into his equations of general relativity. And you can see here a very sad and despondent Albert Einstein. <laughs> he was on to what he thought was one of the biggest discoveries, but it turned out to be his biggest blunder. So he literally threw away the, the cosmological constant. He said, forget it, I'm done with it. Threw it out of his equations 12 years later. However, lambda, we're going to find out tonight, is actually very important to understanding the nature and the existence of dark energy. So Einstein, you never want to count them out. Even smart guys, when they make mistakes, stumble onto something. As cosmology developed throughout the 20th century, more and more ideas began to surface. I'm not going to make tonight's talk a, um, a study in cosmology. However, I'm going to highlight some of the main points. Alan Sandage in 1961 basically said that cosmology is the, is the search for two parameters. H naught, the Hubble constant, and then Q naught, the deceleration parameter. Again, the assumption was that if the universe is expanding, its rate of expansion should be slowing with time. So one way to illustrate this is uh, the apple. You can't talk about mathematics, you can't talk about gravity without talking about the apple. So if I throw the apple up in the air, what happens? Initially, I'm putting energy into the apple, and it's accelerating away from me. However, its rate of acceleration is slowing with time because the Earth's gravity is <coughs> acting on the apple and pulling it back down. So I throw it up, and initially it accelerates. Gravity pulls it back down, so it slows down with time until it reaches the peak, and then eventually it reverses and pulls back in on itself. So on a higher level, you can think of the universe this way. Big bang, big crunch, right? Big bang. Big crunch, or big bang, ganab, gib. Big bang, ganab, gib, which is big bang spelled backwards. <laughs> All right? So that was the assumption going into the latter part of the 20th century, that if the universe is expanding, gravity would eventually slow the rate of expansion and pull the universe back in on itself. And that's where this deceleration parameter comes from. Notice the negative sign here. This is what the deceleration parameter looks like today. When it was first postulated, it was positive. A negative deceleration parameter implies an acceleration. 
So a little foreshadowing in our presentation tonight, we're going to show you where this negative sign came from in the definition of the deceleration parameter for cosmology. Two numbers, H naught, Q naught, H naught, Q naught, Alan Sandage, cosmology. So in the 90s, we had technology finally getting to the point where we can study the universe on a high-level scale. And of course, Hubble is being one of the main instruments that has allowed us to do this. There are others too, Spitzer, Chandra, there are literally big glass telescopes both on Earth and orbiting the Earth that allow us to do astronomy and cosmology on large scales. And one of my favorite images is this. This is the Hubble Deep Field, all right? And uh, this was taken about a, a decade ago. Every blob of light that you see here is a distant galaxy taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. Let's put this in perspective. You're looking at roughly 10,000 galaxies in the constellation Fornax. And if you don't know where the constellation Fornax is, you're not the only one because it's one of the most boring, uninteresting constellations in the night sky. When Hubble was launched, astronomers got to the point where, let's see what this thing can do. It's like a new toy. Let's test it. So they picked out a section of the sky that was completely black, completely uninteresting, and nothing going on, and they decided to point the Hubble at it and keep it there for several hours and see what they could see. And this is what they saw. 10,000 galaxies, three arc minutes across. Put that in perspective. Hold a grain of sand in your hand, okay? Hold it up at arm's length and look through that grain of sand. And if you were to veer out into space, roughly 13 billion light years distant, this is what you would see. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of galaxies. The universe is filled with galaxies. So that's what this image here is representing. A grain of sand at arm's length, exposed out into the far reaches of space, contains tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of galaxies. All these galaxies have mass, both ordinary, baryonic matter, and of course dark matter. Mass, of course, creates a gravitational field. So the thinking is that all of these galaxies should be pulling on each other and slowing down the rate of expansion of the universe. So in the 90s, once the technology caught up with us, scientists went on a quest to look for the rate of deceleration of the universe. How do you do this? There's basically three main techniques. Standard candles, standard rulers, and then the growth of fluctuations. For the purposes of tonight's talk, we're going to talk in depth about that one. We're going to briefly mention that one, and we ain't going to talk about that one. So that's what's going to happen. All right, standard candles. Very important aspect of stellar and galactic astronomy. What is a standard candle? This is a good analogy. A standard candle is basically an object of known intrinsic luminosity or brightness. And if you know how bright it is, you can calculate the distance to that object. So a good example from everyday life would be if you're driving down the street and you see a row of stoplights, okay, maybe three or four of them, you see a red light, unless it's either going to be a red light or a green light. You know how bright they are, but if you see a light in front of you, and maybe you see another one off in the distance and then another one beyond that. You see a row of stoplights as you're driving. The ones that are further away from you are going to appear dimmer than the ones up front. However, their intrinsic brightness is about the same. Another example of a standard candle might be a 100 watt light bulb. If we had a bunch of 100 watt light bulbs in this room, if I had one in front of me, it would appear brighter than a 100 watt light bulb at the back of the room. So it's called the inverse square law. The closer an object is, the brighter its apparent luminosity is going to be, as opposed to an object of the same brightness that's further away. Same, as, same concept in astronomy. We can look for objects in the universe whose brightness, intrinsic brightness that we know, and then use that to calculate the distance to that object. Okay, we're not going to go over this in a lot of detail, but this is the cosmic distance ladder. All right. Bill, you did a presentation on this a few months ago. It's on YouTube. If you want to learn this, watch this presentation. Here's what I want you guys to know. Okay? This is, this is the cosmic distance ladder. In Hubble's time, he used a technique called Cepheid variables, which is down here on this plot. 
to calculate the distance to the galaxies and analyze the redshift. What you can do is you can use a technique like Cepheid variables and one of these other ones to calculate the distance to a galaxy and then find another object of higher intrinsic brightness, calibrate its brightness and distance, and then use it to find objects further out in space. So here we have Cepheids. They go from about 1 to 10 kiloparsecs. If you can get to a galaxy here using this technique where a supernova occurs, you now have a new standard candle. And on this chart, Cepheid, or supernovas up here, type 1a supernovas, will get you to hundreds of megaparsecs, which means you can go out billions of light years into the universe and find how far away objects are at the far edges of the universe. So that's what I want you to get out of the cosmic distance ladder. Use a technique like Cepheids to get to a galaxy where a supernova occurs, calibrate the supernova, use it as a standard candle, and then use that supernova to calculate the distance to galaxies on the, on the far edges of the universe. Mark Phillips was the man who did this. He was actually part of the supernova, uh, the high C, uh, I'm sorry, the high Z supernova research team. And he started studying supernovas back in the 80s. And he developed something called the Phillips relationship, which was between the peak luminosity of a type 1a supernova and the speed of, of, uh, of lumin luminosity after maximum light. So bottom line is Mark Phillips was the astronomer who successfully calibrated type 1a supernova as a type of standard candle. Now what is a type 1a supernova? There are two types of, basically two main types of supernova. There are, are supernovas that emit hydrogen and then there are ones that don't emit a lot of hydrogen. A type 2 is, a, is an exploding star that would emit a lot of hydrogen. Type 1a doesn't. A type 1a supernova occurs when a star called a white dwarf has mass put onto it by a companion star and then undergoes a thermonuclear run runaway. And so you see kind of, let me just kind of walk you through this. You have a binary star system, a red giant, the gravity of the white dwarf sucks material off of the, of the uh, companion star. The mass increases and then it blows up. And basically think of it as a hydrogen bomb with the, the size of the Earth with more mass than the sun exploding. And it's very bright and it's very powerful. So this is kind of a step-by-step -step process of how this will work. You have two stars here in a binary system. One has more mass than the other. So the more massive star will swell up into a giant quicker and move off of main sequence. When that happens, it, it throws off a planetary nebula. There's an envelope of gas that circles around the two stars, and then that shell expands. Eventually, the more massive star shrinks into a white dwarf. So now you have the white dwarf and the main sequence star continuing to orbit each other. And then later, this star right here will move off of main sequence and swell up into a giant star. When that happens, the gravity of the white dwarf will suck material off of the red giant star, and a thermonuclear, a thermonuclear runaway will occur. The star will explode, and you get a type 1a supernova. So a type 1a is a good standard candle because of the physics involved. We know that Chandrasekhar demonstrated that an object can only can only acquire as much mass as 1.4 solar masses in order to remain stable, in order for the gravity of that object to continue to keep the, uh, the object intact. In other words, we call it uh, the structure of the atom. If it gets beyond 1.4 solar masses, the gravity will be too strong. So we know how much mass, roughly, a white dwarf will have. It will, it, it will, it will have a limit of 1.4 solar masses. So when it acquires more mass through this process of accretion, then it will go beyond the Chandrasekhar limit and it will explode. In the process of exploding, this type 1a supernova will, carbon and oxygen will be converted into nickel and the brightness, one of the main aspects, one of the main 
sources of the brightness comes from radioactive decay of nickel into cobalt. It's part of the process of the, uh, of the supernova exploding. And then, of course, light also comes from the, the material being ejected from the star itself as it explodes. And there's a shock wave that uh, goes through the star. So it's a combination of the radioactive nickel and then also the, uh, the luminosity from the material being ejected. How bright is this star? A supernova, a type 1a supernova, will reach an absolute magnitude of about negative 19.3 or five billion times brighter than our sun. Put that in perspective, for a brief moment in time, a couple of weeks, a type 1a supernova will outshine an entire galaxy of stars. Now try to wrap your mind around this. This is a quarter. If the, if the solar system were scaled down in size to this quarter, the sun at the center, and the orbit of Pluto on the outside of this quarter, the Milky Way galaxy would be comparable in size to the continental United States. This quarter right here would contain an object so small that I couldn't see it, representing the dimensions of the Type 1a supernova. And for a brief moment in time, it will, it will release <coughs> enough energy to outshine all the other quarters in the continent of the United States. That's what happens in a Type 1a supernova. Now, in 2006, scientists did a simulation of a Type 1a supernova using supercomputers. And um, I'm going to see if it works. Here we go. 128 of the most powerful supercomputers were linked together in 2006 to simulate the effects of a Type 1a supernova. 60,000 hours of simulation time produced, among other things, this simulation right here. So you can see that this blue sphere, which you can barely see, a little bit smaller than the Earth, containing more mass than our Sun. A bubble initially punctures through the surface of the sphere and then expands as the energy is converted, or the mass is converted into energy. And then this shell, or this envelope of material, expands out from the star. The total kinetic energy of the ejected material from this supernova can easily equal or exceed all the energy that our sun puts out over its entire 10 billion year lifetime. So this is a, a computer simulation of what happens in a type 1a supernova when a, when a white dwarf blows up. And this is from 2006. 128 supercomputers, most powerful computers in the world, 60,000 hours of simulation time to run the algorithm to produce that simulation. Some examples. Um, this galaxy, SN 1984D, or 1994D, it's, a, uh, it's in the constellation Virgo. Here's a spiral galaxy. You can see the nucleus here. There's the type 1A supernova. Um, this one is interesting. Those of you who remember from a couple years ago, in the pinwheel galaxy, it's in Ursa Major. Spiral galaxy. This is actually the closest type 1A supernova ever seen or analyzed by astronomers. And there's a lot of write-up on this. Here it is right here, only 20 million light years away, which is actually pretty much in our backyard. So astronomers had a chance to really analyze this supernova and learn a lot about the physics involved and come to uh, several discoveries. This actually, in and of itself, is a talk. Very interesting. We can use Type 1a as, as uh, standard candles. You can see here, you know, the same galaxy image, three different, this, this little speck right here as the uh, supernova is um, occurring. The light curve looks something like this. The, the, uh, the, the characteristics of the light curve of a Type 1a supernova are pretty much all the same for every type of uh, Type 1a supernova. You see the initial, um, you know, the initial uh, ex expansion and then the slow decay over the, over the course of uh, several weeks. And we can analyze the spectra of the type 1a supernova and come to an understanding of what types of elements are being released. So this is um, a plot of several different type 1a supernovas <coughs> from the uh, HiZ research team 
one of the high C supernova research team, one of the teams that was looking for type 1A supernova. And one of the things that Mark Phillips discovered was that the brightest supernova wax and wane more slowly than the faintest. So we found a relationship between basically the, the, uh, the decay rate of the, the light curve versus the, um, how bright, intrinsically bright, bright the supernova were. But this lower plot is probably is, is more important because here we were able, scientists were able to use stretching and scaling techniques to take a variety of different supernova and essentially calibrate them to one standard light curve that can be used as a standard candle for determining the distance to distant objects in the uh, in the universe. So. Um, the, uh, the, the research astronomers or the research teams back in the 90s were able to do this. So here you see a bunch of individual curves. Here you see one curve with a bunch of supernova calibrated and scaled so that we get essentially one, we essentially get the standard candle that we can use. Supernovas are great as standard candles. The one problem is they're very rare. In a typical galaxy like our Milky Way, a type 1a supernova may only occur, if we're lucky, once a century. On average, you're, you're talking maybe two or three type 1a supernova in a, in a thousand years, in a millennium. So if you have a galaxy that you really, really like, and you want to determine your, the distance to that galaxy, um, you can't just stare at it and wait for a supernova to go off, because it's going to be a while. It could be several hundreds or even thousands of years. Personally, I'm kind of jealous of um, Tycho Brahe and Johann Kepler. I don't understand how a human being can witness two supernovas in, in their same lifetime. I mean, was it 40 years apart? Brahe saw one, and then Kepler saw one 40 years later, something like that. I'm waiting for Betelgeuse to blow up. I look at that star every night, because I know once it blows, it's going to be one of the brightest objects in the sky. So. Supernovas don't occur very often. So the other problem is um, when you find them, they're very random, and you've got to get your act together. In other words, once a type 1a supernova occurs, you've got to have your instrumentation lined up, and you've got to be analyzing the light from that supernova in order to do your science. So they're rare. They don't occur very often. They're random. You have no idea when or where they're going to occur, and they're very fleeting. You must observe them promptly after the explosion, because they're going to decay in only a couple of weeks. How do we do this? What we do is we put the universe on surveillance, literally. We have to look at thousands of galaxies all at once. We use wide angle, wide field telescopes to take a snapshot of the sky, maybe the size of a full moon, containing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of galaxies. And you got to look at about 5,000 supernovas in one, or 5,000 galaxies in one week just to find maybe one supernova. So you got to look at tens of thousands of galaxies. Okay, so here is one of the telescopes that's used to do this. It's in Hawaii. Hawaii is a great place to do astronomy <coughs> because you've got, first of all, the elevation, you're on top of a volcano. Secondly, the atmosphere. Um, the conditions of the atmosphere in Hawaii are very favorable. This is one of the world's largest digital telescopes. We now have CCD cameras, which are like the digital cameras that we all have either on our cell phones or that we can buy in electronic stores. Put those on steroids and you get something like this. This is a 1.4 gigapixel CCD camera telescope that can take um, high definition digital images of the sky. So you can survey the entire sky in Hawaii once per week you got to look at 5,000 galaxies to find one type 1a supernova, roughly 500,000 galaxies to find 100 supernova. So you, you want to find thousands of type, of, um, type 1a supernovas in order to increase the number of data points. Remember the Hubble plot I showed you earlier, the diagonal line going up? Supernovas will give, us, give scientists the opportunity to expand that plot out to the far reaches of space to see what the trend is in the expansion of the universe. So, here's how it works. New moon, second new moon, 
So roughly you have a 28-day period between new moons. You point your telescopes at the sky, you look at a lot of galaxies, thousands of them. So you may observe tens of thousands of galaxies, you wait three weeks for the next moon, new moon, roughly, and then you look at the same field again. So you take a bunch of snapshots, wait three weeks, then you go back, look at the same section of the sky. You're looking at thousands of galaxies, and in a given galaxy, a supernova might occur, and then you've got the light curve roughly right about here when you look at it the second time around. So you're getting it at its peak, and then you can analyze that type 1a supernova and use it to calibrate use it as a standard candle to determine the distance to that galaxy. So the team started doing this in the 90s, and they did it over and over and over again. And you can see here, um, Keck in Hawaii, you've got the uh, telescope now down in Chile. I think it's the largest ground-based telescope in the world. Fantastic technology. Of course, we've got the Hubble, um, Berkeley, they've got um, telescopes, very, very powerful telescopes at the uh, University of California, Berkeley and then uh, I mean, telescopes all over the world, both on the ground and in space, looking at the sky, taking thousands of snapshots, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of galaxies, between new moons, looking for supernova. Here are some examples. So you saw the Hubble Deep Field earlier. You may have a very small section of the sky where you look at um, a galaxy and then an object here. You look at the same object three weeks later, and you can see that there's a difference in the intrinsic brightness of that object. So that's a clue that that could be a, a supernova. So you see the difference here. Now it could be something else. It could be, it could be an asteroid. It could be an object closer to the Earth coming into the field of view. But typically, if you analyze the spectra of that object, you can determine its contents and then determine from that whether it's a type 1a supernova and then you start doing your, your distance calculations. So that's, what this, that's kind of a, a snapshot of this process. And this comes from the Supernova Cosmology team back in 1998. So here's another example before, after. The arrows help. You know, the arrows help us find the supernovas. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. they're not there. So before, after, before, after, before, after. One of the things I'm not showing um, this is from 1998 also. There are images out there where you can see a blob of light representing the galaxy and then another smudge of light representing the type 1a supernova. And you see that they're almost equal in terms of luminosity. The type 1a is, is as bright as the galaxy. So there were two teams that did this back in the 90s looking for the rate of deceleration of the universe. The high z research team <coughs> and then the Supernova Cosmology Project. Leader of the Supernova Cosmology Project is this man right here, Saul, Perl Saul Perlmutter. And uh, Brian Schmidt led this team. This is Brian Schmidt right here. This man right back here is Alex Filipenko. He is a, um, he's a re an astronomer at the University of California, Berkeley. His team has found more type 1a supernovas over the last decade and a half than all the other teams in the world combined. He's also a brilliant lecturer, very intelligent man. This man right here is Adam Reese. Adam is the astronomer credited for looking at type 1a supernova, analyzing the data, and coming to the conclusion that the universe is actually accelerating. Adam, Brian, and Saul were awarded the Nobel Prize for physics in 2011. So these guys are the superstars right here. So anyway, they were very competitive, very competitive teams. Both teams working independently, and each team trying to beat the other team out. What happened was, in 1998, the high z supernova team analyzed 16 distant and 34 new, nearby supernova, and they came to an amazing discovery. They discovered that the more distant supernova were actually 25% fainter than they should have been. And six months later, the Supernova Cosmology Project came to the same conclusion. What does that mean? The further, the more distant supernova were fainter than they should have been, even in a universe that had no matter. What that means is 
that something had to cause those objects to go further out and thus be much fainter. And that was the clue to the accelerating universe. Far off supernova, 25% fainter than they should have been, something had to push those objects out to the far reaches of space in order for them to be so faint. So it was kind of like when they did their analysis and they ran the data, they, uh, they got the wrong sign. They were trying to measure the deceleration rate of the universe, the rate at which the expansion of the universe is slowing with time. Instead, what they found out was that it's not only not slowing down, but it's speeding up. It's, it's speeding up. The, the rate of expansion of the universe is accelerating or speeding up with time. And it was counterintuitive. That didn't make any sense because gravity should be pulling all the galaxies back together. Here's the data plot. Now, the Hubble diagram, what they were able to do is expand it out. Now, without getting into the details of what this plot means, here's all I want you to know. If it's a diagonal line that just goes up like this, where this dotted line is, that would mean that the, um, the universe is essentially expanding at a constant rate. If the data fell below the line, then the rate of expansion of the universe should be decreasing with time. Um, the data from these two groups, the blue dots representing the high Z team, <coughs> the red dots representing the supernova cosmology project, more or less fell on this line. But as you got further out, this is redshift right here. All right, Z is the redshift parameter. What does redshift mean? Redshift is a measure of how much the light from an object far out in space is shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. The more severe the redshift, the further out it is and the faster it's moving. So as we go along the x-axis here and z gets greater, the more positive z is, the greater the redshift, the more distant the object and the faster it's moving. So to, to kind of orient you, a redshift of 0.1 would be about a billion light years away. So we can now go out to a redshift of about 1.0. And you see that these data points here are starting to actually go above the line into this region right here. That's significant. That tells us, that gives us a clue to an expanding universe. Now on this plot right here, this, this um, shows the difference between the supernova data points and Hubble's law. Applying Hubble's law versus what the type 1a supernova data was showing us. If it was a constant rate of expansion, then all the data should fall on this straight line of zero right here. But as you can see, most of the data points here are falling above the line instead of below the line. So doing analysis, the, um, what this data tells us here is that this is, again, another sign or another indica indication of an expanding universe. Same type of plot. Um, the pink regions here representing a deceleration, decelerating universe. The blue regions representing an accelerating universe. Yellow dots, supernova cosmology project. Orange dots, high Z supernova team. And you can see that a lot of the dots here are falling in the blue region. Zero line here being uh, constant rate of expansion. So this right here, because the data, the further out we go and the, the, more, the greater the redshift is, the data falls into this blue region here, again indicating possible acceleration. The high redshift supernova are fainter than would be expected even for an empty cosmos. No objects, nothing going on. It would be like me throwing this apple up in the air and instead of it slowing down and falling back down toward Earth, it would just continue, if the Earth didn't exist, if I threw it up in a vacuum, it would just move at a, at, a, at a constant speed, further and further and further away. If that happened, there's no universe, all, all that existed was, was this apple, then if that was analogous to the supernova results, those supernova were fainter than if the apple had been accelerating at a constant rate. What that means is something is pushing these objects further and further out into space. Evidence of expansion. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about this graph. I'm actually going to move on. Adam Reese, 1998, 
Supernova Cosmology Project. I'm sorry, Hi Z Research Team. He did an analysis of the, of the supernova data, and he was the man who was actually responsible for coming to the conclusion that the universe is not only accelerating now, but it was not always accelerating. He analyzed the data from the supernova and was able to plot the data and come to the conclusion that the, that the universe is accelerating right now, but at a time in the past, it was actually decelerating. In fact, kind of a humorous story with Adam Reese. After this discovery was made, an article was published in the New York Times, and the title of the article was something to the effect of, The, the Cosmic Jerk is Discovered. And it had a picture of Adam Reese. <laughs> now, when you look at, a, at, a, at an article in a newspaper, what do you see? You see the headline and you see the picture. So Alex Filipenko gets a call from his mother saying, what's going on here? Now, who's this cosmic jerk who discovered, uh, you know, the, the expansion of the cosmos? So, but anyway, Adam was the man who was responsible. The first man who looked at the supernova data and discovered that it was significant in terms of the accelerating universe, and also that the universe was decelerating in the past and is, is now accelerating. So this, this was the cover of Science Magazine in 1998. December 18th was the breakthrough of the year by Science Magazine. And uh, basically in February, the High z team announced their results. Six months later, the Supernova Cosmology Project announced their results. And um, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Reese, Schmitter, I'm sorry, uh, Schmidt, and Perlmutter. And this was the first time that scientists came to the conclusion that the universe is expanding. And this was, this was breakthrough. So we've known this now for about 15 years. But this was the, uh, the moment of discovery. So you can see Albert Einstein blowing uh, you know, universes out of his pipe. And um, this is the evidence of an accelerating universe. So this was the landmark discovery for this. Now, to get on the cover of a, of a magazine like Science Magazine has to be a pretty significant discovery in the area of cosmology. Because typically it's biologists who get on the cover of Science Magazine, not cosmologists or astronomers. Now, going forward, this is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So we talked about supernova. We talked about exploding stars, very, very bright. You can use them as standard candles to measure the distances to far off objects. There are other techniques beyond supernova, independent of supernova, that can be used also to measure the, the expanding universe. And one of them is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This is a telescope in New Mexico, 2.5 meter wide. And uh, the analysis began back in 2000, so about 13 years ago. We now have the technology where we can look deep into the universe and map out hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of objects. And that's what the Sloan does. We're now creating a catalog of millions of galaxies, where they're located, how far they are, and what they look like. 500 million objects and a spectra from more than a million objects. The other thing that the Sloan was used for was a technique called baryon acoustic oscillations. And this is like sound waves rippling through the universe, early universe. Um, I'm just going to mention it in this talk, but it's another technique independent of supernova that were used to calibrate the distances to far off objects. So we're going to take a journey now. After this data was collected and mapped out, a simulation was done to sort of give us a high level picture of what the universe looks like. So imagine getting on board a starship and traveling at superluminous speed from the Earth to the far reaches of space. What would that look like? This simulation was created. Now, you can barely see it, but every object here, as we expand out from the Earth, is actually a galaxy. It's a real galaxy that was recorded and measured. And you can see structure forming in the universe, a wall of galaxies. And you also got areas that are, are void. The further out you go, you see the supermassive black holes gobbling up um, matter and um, baryons. And you get further out, you can see kind of a high-level structure of what the universe would look like. A wall of galaxies, clumps, voids, and then a three-dimensional. These voids right here are actually 
areas of our Milky Way galaxy that could not be, uh, that were interfering with the simulation. And if we go even further out, we get to a very mysterious part of the universe. This is the afterglow from the creation of the universe. It's called the cosmic microwave background. So we're expanding out now billions of light years. And this fossil, this is the fossilized light left over from the creation of the universe, the cosmic microwave background. Very significant. So this is a high level view, given the work of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, of what the universe would look like from galaxies near us to the far reaches of space to the afterglow from the moment of creation. And this is what it looks like. The W map is the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe. It was launched a decade and a half ago. And this is basically the remnant light from the creation of the universe, 380,000 years after the, the moment of creation, sometimes called the Big Bang. Now, what you're basically looking at is white Gaussian noise. It's the hissing sound that you hear on the radio. But what is significant about this is that the dark regions and the light regions represented by red are very, very subtle fluctuations in the temperature, the background temperature of the afterglow from the moment of creation. This is before galaxies existed, before any type of structure existed. And this gives us a clue to the origin of the universe. The best way to think about this is hold an orange in your hand. You can feel some of the, uh, the imperfections on the surface of the orange. So those imperfections would be analogous to the anisotropies or the variations in the cosmic microwave background. This image took several years to be mapped out by the W map. And uh, Michael Turner um, has a saying that uh, when you look at this, if this image right here makes your heart go pitter patter, then you know you're probably destined for a career in, in cosmology. So this is very significant in determining some more information on the universe, the cosmic microwave background. And it was in initially discovered by these guys Arnold Penzias and Robert Wilson, they work for Bell Labs, and uh, they use a, um, a large antenna to bounce radio signals off of balloon satellites. They were doing work for Bell Labs, and they kind of accidentally discovered the cosmic microwave background, which was a clue to the origin of the universe. At first they thought it was pigeon droppings inside of their instruments, but they kept hearing a constant hissing sound in the background, and it turns out it's the afterglow cosmic microwave background, CMB, from the origin of the universe. And the average temperature is about 2.7 Kelvin. So the universe is very, very cold and very, very dim, dark. But this was where it began. The existence of the CMB was the clue that we needed to prove, that, the, that scientists needed to prove that the universe <coughs> had a beginning and that the steady state theory of Fred Hoyle is basically obliterated. Now, okay, we got to talk about this slide. This is where I got to stretch your thinking a little bit. All right, we have the we have the cosmic microwave background. We can use the CMB to measure the geometry <coughs> of the universe. So here's what here here's how this works. Okay, you basically got three possibilities. You've got a saddle shaped universe, a flat universe, and then a spherical shaped universe defined by something called the critical density, all right? General relativity describes the connection between the density of the universe and its geometry. The density being the amount of stuff that's in the universe. Matter and energy. So if we know the geometry of the universe, we can infer the density of the stuff in the universe, which dictates whether the universe will expand forever or collapse back to a single point. So what is the critical density? It's this formula right here, which basically gives us a number, 8 pi h naught being the Hubble constant. G is the universal gravitational constant. Don't worry about the math. Here is the Hubble constant. Here is the critical density, 9 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms per meter cubed. Throwing all that aside, what I want you to get out of this slide is omega. All right, Omega is the important parameter, and that's measured the omega value is calculated by taking the density of whatever it is that you're looking for and dividing it by the critical density, which is this number right here. 
So it could be the density of matter, or it could be the density of energy. Okay? So, omega total is going to be omega matter plus omega lambda. Omega lambda being some mysterious force that we call dark energy, or something like a cosmological constant that's causing the universe to expand. So omega matter, omega energy, add them together, you get omega total. Omega total tells us this value right here will tell us the geometry of the universe. If omega is 1, critical density, flat Euclidean universe, like this table. All right? If it's greater than 1, we've got a curved universe like a sphere. If it's less than 1, it's saddle-shaped. My math teacher in high school took astronomy years ago when he was in college, wrote a paper on the geometry of the universe, and described it as being this way. Basically, less than one. What does W math tell us? Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe analyzing the cosmic microwave background. The universe is flat. So, okay, this is a plot. So a straight line, diagonal, omega matter equals zero. Actually, so this would be a, um, a constant expansion. In this scenario right here, if omega is greater than 1, we have a universe that expands, slows down, and then contracts into a big crunch. That's what this plot right here represents. So it's like me throwing the apple up in the air and then coming right back down. Right here, if it goes up and curves up like this, that means that I throw the apple up in the air, and it flies through the ceiling, past the Earth's atmosphere, out into space, and flies off forever. So this is a universe that expands forever, this plot right here. And this is where we kind of think we are today. So getting back to the results of the W map, the largest temperature differences between the red portions and the blue regions, dark, light, is about 0 .004 Kelvin. Now, we can calculate the distance to these patches right here. We can calculate the, the size of these patches right here. And by doing that, we can calculate the angle. The angular scale will tell us the geometry of the universe. And by analyzing the W map data, we found that omega is roughly 1, telling us that the universe is flat. So the results of the W map, without complicating everything, is pointing to a flat Euclidean universe that should expand and not contract back down in on itself in a, uh, in a big crunch scenario. What is significant about that is there's not enough matter in the universe, ordinary matter and dark matter, to give us a flat universe. So there's a whole bunch of extra stuff that's needed. Remember what I said earlier? Einstein's general theory of relativity tells us that the mass content and the energy content of the universe will tell us what the geometry of the universe is. W map tells us that the universe is flat. We don't have enough matter in the universe to give us a flat universe. We need a lot of something else. And that something else is dark energy and a lot of it is needed to give us a flat universe. So the results of the W map were also surprising. So now we've got two things. Supernova data, the most distant supernova are far fainter than they should be, evidence of an expansion. W map data tells us the geometry of the universe is flat. In order to get a flat universe, there's got to be a lot of something else, some stuff in the universe to give us a flat universe. So there's not enough matter to do that, so we need a whole lot of energy, and we call that dark energy. Now, baryon acoustic oscillations, I'm just going to mention this briefly. This is also the subject of another talk. It's basically like sound waves rippling in the early part of the universe. Um, it's like sound waves, but it's really the, uh, the baryons and the photons interacting with each other and decoupling, <coughs> causing these ripples through the fabric of the universe, and we can do Scientists can do um, analysis of the correlation of galaxies from the W map and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey 
and come to a 490 million light year yardstick. So we talked about standard candles earlier. This is a standard ruler. And we can use that standard ruler to go further and further back and measure how the universe expanded or was behaving in the distant past. All that aside, the point of this slide is we've got three techniques now to measure the expansion of the universe. Type 1a supernova, cosmic microwave background, geometry of the universe, baryon acoustic oscillations. And this is the plot of those three things. On the y-axis, you have omega lambda. On the x-axis, you have omega matter. Supernova, cosmic microwave background, baryon acoustic oscillations. This line, this line, and this line right here intersect at this point right here. And this little gray sphere, if you draw a line out to here, you get to an omega lambda of about 0.7. If you drop down, you get to an omega matter of about 0.3. What does this tell us? 30% of the universe is roughly matter. 70% of the universe is roughly some type of energy that behaves like a cos cosmological constant. For lack of a better word, we'll call it dark energy. This is the data and the analysis that leads us to the discovery of dark energy. The supernova in and of themselves would have been enough. But you combine the supernova with the CMB and the BAO, and they intersect at this point right here. Now we have an idea of just how much stuff there is and how it's distributed. So, Einstein threw away the cosmological constant. Now he's back. Lambda's revisited. We now know that there's some stuff. All right, let's, uh, let's continue our talk on dark energy. So we talked about three techniques independent of each other to sort of hint at the discovery of this stuff called dark energy, or, or uh, for lack of a better term, some, something that exists in the universe that's causing it to expand, not only expand, but expand more quickly with time. The universe is accelerating. What is this dark energy? The short answer is we don't know. It's end of story. <laughs> However, there are some ideas, there's hundreds of ideas, and I'm just going to discuss a couple of them here, that are at the forefront of modern particle physics that might give us a clue to what dark energy is and its nature and how it behaves. And that's what I want to talk about in the, second, in the second part of this talk. So it could behave like a cosmological constant, the lambda parameter that Einstein initially introduced and then threw out and we put back in. In other words, it's something that's sort of constant, causing create, uh, space to expand. Or it could be something called quintessence that we're going to talk about in, this, in the second half of this talk. So let's do a quick review here of general relativity. The, gravi the, uh, the gravitational attraction in general relativity that one object exerts on another is dependent on two parameters. All right, one is the, the, uh, the mass attraction that one object exerts on another. I mean, that's what we experience every day. This apple falls to the floor because the Earth's gravity is pulling on the apple, and um, these two bodies of mass are interacting with each other. So that's intuitive. That's what Newton ultimately proposed when he formulated his laws of gravity. Same thing with general relativity. It's the gravitational attraction due to matter on matter. We call that the mass density, or rho, per unit volume. However, in general relativity, there's also another parameter known as the pressure. What is pressure? The Earth is exerting an outward pressure on me right now that's preventing me from falling through to the surface of the Earth. And it's that outward pressure that actually adds some additional gravitational attraction to, my, to the mass of my body. The outward pressure corresponds to an inward gravitational pull. You weigh a little bit more on the Earth when you factor in your weight in relativistic terms. In other words, general relativity. So it's the attraction of matter on matter, and it's also the pressure. <coughs> Mass density and pressure. General relativity. So those two parameters. Now, take this a step further. The expansion of the universe 
the rate of change, the change in the rate of expansion of the universe is proportional to P, I'm sorry, rho, the mass density, times the speed of light, uh, the speed of light squared plus 3P, where rho is the energy density and P is the pressure. So this right here is the term that is proportional to the rate of expansion of the universe. If the universe is slowing down with time as a result of matter pulling on matter, this term here should be negative. That's why the sign is negative. So for normal types of matter, rho and p are positive. If this number is positive and that number is positive, this entire number is negative, the universe slows down. However, Let's just say, hypothetically speaking, that P, pressure, is less than zero. In other words, it's negative. Take it a step further. Let's suppose that P is less negative than one-third of rho C squared. Why that number? If this number right here is more negative than this number right here, then P C squared plus 3P is going to be less than zero, so this is going to be negative. And this entire term here, rho c squared plus 3p, this entire term right here is going to be positive. That tells us that the rate of expansion of the universe, instead of being a negative number, would be a positive number, and the universe would accelerate in its rate of expansion. So, expansion accelerates, speeds up with time, if this number right here is positive or greater than zero, general relativity. If space were filled with a substance of negative pressure great enough to overcome the positive energy density, then the net effect on the universe would be repulsion. We think that the dark energy is something like that. It's some substance in the universe that has a negative pressure that's causing the fabric of space and time itself to expand. Negative pressure, positive in terms of the rate of expansion general relativity. So hold that thought in your mind. It's a negative pressure. Okay? Now, let's talk about the vacuum itself. Empty space is not as empty as we think. We see blackness, we see emptiness, but if we could get to the quantum level, really, really small, what space actually is, is like a seething froth of particles and antiparticles that are popping into existence all the time, teeming with activity everywhere, including all around us. Very, very small subatomic particles that are popping into existence, existing for a very, very short period of time, and then disappearing. Empty space produces little packages of energy, delta E, out of nothing for short times, delta T, such that the product of the two is, this is a really, really small number called Planck's constant. What is this? What does this mean? Before we talk about it, we've got to talk about the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Werner Heisenberg, brilliant guy. Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle tells us that at the quantum level, we cannot know for any, with 100% with certainty where a particle exists or how long, where a particle is and how long it's going to exist. We cannot know the precise energy of a point at a fixed time with infinite precision. So there's an uncertainty at the quantum level. Simplifying this, I know that this apple is right here. Okay, I know that if I throw the apple in this direction, the, my arm is putting energy into this apple, and it's going to move in that direction. That's what happens at the macrocosmic level in our universe. If I were to take this apple and shrink it down 10 trillion times to the size of an electron, all the rules that we experience in our everyday world disappear. I could throw this apple, and it could disappear and reappear over there. It could clone itself and be here, and it could be over here. And it could behave in just ways that are completely fictitious to us in our mind. That's what's going on at the, macro, at the microcosmic level. And that's really what's meant by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We cannot know with absolute certainty where particles are, where they exist. So there's an uncertainty in energy, multiplied by the uncertainty of time is equal to Planck's constant. Bottom line, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we don't know with infinite precision where a particle exists. 
So applying that to the vacuum of space, we have particles, literally, that could come into existence all the time and annihilate each other. What could some of these particles be? Neutrinos and antineutrinos, quarks and antiquarks, electrons and positrons, protons and antiprotons. And matter and basically it's antimatter constituent are literally popping into existence all the time. What happens is they, they, they're born, they live for a short period of time, fractions of a second, then they meet and annihilate each other. Kind of like two people who are in a dysfunctional relationship. <laughs> so, born, live, die. Born, live, die. Happening all the time within the vacuum. If this is happening, and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells us that it is happening, that could be a clue to the existence of dark energy. Now, what's interesting is, let's look at the hydrogen atom. If you measure the energy levels of the hydrogen atom, the value that you get in the laboratory will not agree with the theoretical calculated energy levels of the hydrogen atom if you don't take into, into account the quantum effects. This stuff right here. So this is laboratory evidence for the existence of quantum fluctuations. If you measure the energy level of the hydrogen atom and you take into account that this stuff is going on right here, empty space continually creates and destroys virtual <coughs> particles because they don't live very long, and there's an energy that's created as a result of these virtual particles. Taking that into effect, the theoretical calculations for the energy level of the hydrogen atom agree with the measured results for the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. But if you don't take into account the quantum effects, you get the wrong answer. This is called the Lamb shift in the area of particle physics. Bottom line, this is tangible proof that there's stuff going on in empty space that has a tangible effect on the energy levels of, of atoms. So we know that space is not completely empty. Now, the properties of the vacuum Conservation of energy. If you have a positive energy fluctuation, in a perfect world, there should be a perfect, there should be negative energy fluctuations that perfectly cancel out the positive energy fluctuations. So energy is conserved. So these particles and antiparticles that are coming into existence and annihilating each other, the net energy should cancel out between the positive effects and the negative effects. However, let's suppose for argument's sake that that was not the case. Let's assume that the positive fluctuations in that process slightly outweighed the negative fluctuations. If that were the case, then E would be greater than zero. There would be a negative pressure associated with a positive energy density, and you would get this result right here. Pressure is equal to negative rho C squared. In other words, a negative pressure. Taking this value and plugging it back into our equation for the expansion of the universe, rho c squared plus 3 times p, which is negative p squared, gives us a value of 2 rho c squared, which is greater than 0. And really, the bottom line is that this number right here is now positive. Bottom line, if the positive energy fluctuations slightly outnumber the negative fluctuations. You have energy being introduced into the vacuum of the universe, causing the universe to expand. So there's little delta E's, packages of energy, that are being introduced into the, um, the universe as a result of the energy fluctuations. That's one idea, one thought, in quantum mechanics for what the dark energy could be. What is the laboratory proof for this particular phenomenon? There's an experiment called the Casimir effect, and it's pretty simple. You have two parallel plates that are, are grounded so that there's no electric field, so there's no electrical interaction between the plates, and the mass of these plates is essentially negligible, so you don't have the gravitational effects. You put them in a vacuum, and what happens? 
Over time, these two plates slowly come together. Now, what's causing those two plates to come together? What's causing those two plates to slowly move together is these vacuum fluctuations as a result of these particles and antiparticles that are coming into existence and annihilating each other. So there isn't necessarily a perfect cancellation. There's a momentum. These wave functions, there's a momentum from these wave functions that's causing these plates to get pushed together. I'm not going to get into details about the infinity of waves inside of here versus the infinity of waves outside of here, but there's actually a mathematical proof that the waves inside of these two plates here can be re represented by an infinite number of what are called rational numbers. And the waves outside of the plate can be represented by the infinity of irrational numbers. So you've got infinity versus infinity, but the infinity outside is actually greater than the infinity inside. All that aside, simplest terms, what's causing these two plates to come together is the, uh, moment of the, the pressure on these plates as a result of the, vacuum, the uh, vacuum fluctuations from these particles and antiparticles annihilating each other. So the Casimir effect is an experiment that gives us tangible evidence that there's something going on in the vacuum that has real and measurable results. So, energy, dark energy possibility number one, vacuum fluctuations, lambda could be a, po a property of space where E is greater than zero, pressure is less than zero, a negative pressure that causes space to stretch and stretch, and as space continues to stretch, there's more space, so there's more inter energy being introduced into space, which means it continues to expand even faster. So as the total amount of space grows, the total amount of energy increases. So at the quantum level, all this activity that's going on could be introducing energy into the vacuum, causing it to expand. That's one possibility. The other possibility is something called quintessence. Quintessence stands for fifth essence. You remember from ancient Greek mythology, the four fundamental uh, constituents of the universe, air, water, earth, and fire. So the idea of quintessence came from maybe there's a fifth fundamental force. So, and this fifth fundamental force, what we, now we have, uh, we have gravity, and strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, and electricity and magnetism. Maybe there's a fifth fundamental force called quintessence that we haven't discovered yet and we don't completely understand and its nature is causing the universe to expand. The difference between quintessence and a cosmological constant model for dark energy is quintessence can be dynamic. In other words, it can change. So the idea is it uh, became repulsive. It was attractive in the early universe, and it became repulsive some 10 billion years ago. Think of it as a fluid that fills the universe, and it's causing the universe to expand, kind of like blowing up a balloon. Um, Here's the equation, I'm not going to get into it, but um, basically you have a pressure component, you have a, uh, an energy density component, and you have a potential energy component. It gives us the equation state. But quintessence is, um, is um, it can be dynamic, it can change size, it can be attractive, and it can be repulsive. That's the idea behind it. Now, here's the best way to think of quintessence. You have water, and you have snowflakes. Which one is more symmetrical? Symmetry breaking introduces energy into the universe. Water droplets are perfectly spherical and they're symmetric of about a three-dimensional axis. A ball is completely symmetrical. Snowflakes are less symmetric than water droplets are. They're still symmetric, but they're symmetric about a two-dimensional axis. The idea is when you go from water to ice, symmetry is breaking when you go from a liquid to a solid. And when that happens, energy is released into the outside world. Here's an analogy, okay? Um, so you have solid water here. If I'm going to turn it into vapor, I need to introduce energy to be absorbed by the system, thermodynamics. However, if I'm going to go from a vapor to a solid, energy is going to be released 
And by doing that, energy is being introduced back into the vacuum. That's the idea behind symmetry breaking. So water is less symmetrical than snow. Going from water to snow releases energy. Take this a step further. Let's say you supercool a liquid like water. What does supercooling mean? I can lower the temperature of water below its freezing point and have conditions such that it still remains a liquid and still has what's called a latent heat associated with it. That latent heat is an extra energy in the system that keeps it in the liquid state even though I've lowered the temperature below the freezing point of water. Now, all I have to do is introduce a little bit of something to knock it off balance, and then the water will instantly freeze. There are actually little packets that you can buy somewhere. They're, they're sodium acetate packets that, are, that have a latent heat associated. They're liquid. They're super-cooled liquid. But if you touch them a certain way, they will instantly freeze and heat will be introduced. I think they're used for camping equipment. Sodium acetate liquid packets, super cool, that have a latent heat, heat associated with them. That's an example of symmetry breaking. This is the best way to understand the nature of quintessence. So, let's take this a step further. Let's say that the universe had a force field around it that was analogous to supercooling a liquid, and that force field introduced a latent heat into the overall energy that kept, kept it in a certain state without breaking the symmetry. And then let's say that some entity caused that liquid that was supercooled to break symmetry. So that's like the sodium acetate packet that was supercooled into a liquid state, instantly turning into a solid. If that happened, that latent heat would be an extra amount of energy that was so associated with it. And when that heat or that extra energy was released, it would be um, introduced into the fabric of the universe, causing the universe to expand. I know I'm stretching here, but just help me out. That's the, that's the essence or the idea behind quintessence. That, um, that there could be some additional energy stored that was released at some point in time and introduced into the universe, causing it to expand. So, simplifying this, there are two main ideas for the nature of dark energy. The cosmological constant idea, meaning that it has a has, the sign never changes, and it, um, it expands at a constant rate. And then the, um, the quintessence idea, meaning that it can be dynamic, it can change. It can be positive, it can be negative. It can be attractive, it can be repulsive. We don't know. It's just two of, of many ideas for what dark energy could be, the nature of dark energy. Now, I'm stretching here with this slide, but I have to mention it because this is one of the biggest problems with dark energy and understanding its nature and understanding why the quantity of dark energy is what it is. One of the, uh, the biggest questions in physics today is why this lambda parameter is so small. If omega lambda is calculated by lambda c squared over 3h naught, and if the, the matter density of the universe is the average density divided by the critical density, if you do a simple calculation in quantum physics, you should get a value of omega, of omega lambda, the density of this dark energy in the universe, to be somewhere on the order of 10 to the 60 to 10 to the 120. That's a huge number. However, from WMAP, we're measuring a value of 0.73. So why is there this huge discrepancy between the measured results for the density of dark energy in the universe versus what you would calculate if you applied quantum field mechanics to the equations of uh, general relativity? That's one of the huge questions right now in physics. To be honest, I don't understand 
this to the point where I can even communicate it to you guys. I'm just mentioning it. So if you don't understand, don't worry. I don't understand, and to be honest, the brightest minds in physics don't understand either. The bottom line is this right here. We have a discrepancy between what's calculated versus what's measured. And that's getting us to scratch our heads regarding the nature of dark energy. Not only what it is, but how much of it is there is in, in the universe. Now, we're here. The universe began here. We're going here. If we go back about 5 billion years into the past, the universe was a lot smaller. The mass density of the universe was greater because the volume of the universe was smaller. So since the beginning of the universe, these two quantities, dark matter and dark energy, have sort of been at war with each other. And early in the universe's history, the, um, the dark matter was winning over dark energy. Meaning that the influence on the expansion rate of the universe was dominated by dark matter. However, over time <coughs> as the universe grew, dark energy's influence became more significant than dark matter's influence. And about five billion years ago, they were equal. Today, the, um, the mass density of the universe, or the influence of dark energy, is declining while the, the energy density of the universe or the influence of dark energy is increasing. So it seems as though a war between dark energy and dark matter was decided five billion years ago and the universe is destined to expand forever. If the cosmological constant idea is correct instead of the quintessence idea. If the quintessence idea is correct, then this can change because the dark energy, in terms of its nature, could be attractive again at some point in time. But the idea is dark matter is declining, dark energy is increasing. They were equal in the past. Today, dark, en dark energy dominates over dark matter in terms of the rate of expansion of the universe. Now, remember the big jerk I told you about earlier? Let's plot this out. Origin of the universe, matter, the mass density of the universe dominated. So the rate of expansion in the past dominated, or the rate of expansion in the past was dominated by dark matter. So it was actually decelerating. The universe expanded, got to a point where its volume was significant. Dark energy wins. The volume of the universe is significant enough where the, the, the dark energy dominates over dark matter. We have an inflection point, and it begins to accelerate. The question is, where are we going? So it could either accelerate at a, you know, eventually asymptotically approach some volume and, um, and expand forever. It could change signs and end in a big crunch where it blows up, it slows down, and then gravity takes over and crunches everything back to singularity. Or the rate of expansion could expand so quickly at some point in time that it literally rips the universe apart. Not only galaxy clusters, but individual galaxies, stars, solar systems, planets, and then the atoms. That's the big rip idea. Most scientists reject the big crunch and the big rip, and they believe that the universe will end, it will just continue to expand forever and get colder with time. So, here's a model. Big Bang, inflation, dark ages, matter, the universe cools off, Stars and galaxies are formed. Five billion years ago, dark energy wins over dark matter. Here we are today. The universe is just beginning to get to a point of exponential acceleration. If we take this out into the future, we will enter a phase of exponential expansion. What does that mean? It means that the universe will double in size for every given unit of time. Think of it this way. Checkerboard. 64 squares. I put one penny on square one, I put two pennies on square two, four on square three, and so on and so forth. Doubling on every square the amount of pennies that I had on the previous square. How much money will I have at the end of that exercise? A hundred billion trillion dollars. In other words, a lot of money. That's the idea behind exponential expansion. Apply that to the universe. 
If the, once we get to a point where the universe expands to a certain point where dark energy completely dominates over matter, it will literally double in size for every given unit of time. And then we can have a little fun. Let's go on 100 billion years into the future. The distant galaxies will be so far away we won't be able to see them because light will never reach us. Our, vision of the, our view of the universe will essentially be the Virgo cluster. We will see no evidence of the cosmic microwave background or the relic fossilized light from the early part of the universe. We will see no evidence of an expansion and will essentially be where we were in the 1920s thinking that the universe is the Milky Way galaxy. Now, let's go even further out. Let's go to 100 trillion AD. The universe continues to expand forever. As it expands, galaxies are so far away they can't be seen. The most, distance get, the most distant galaxies are expanding faster than the speed of light. Individual galaxies will use up all of their um, type 1 regions of gas and dust that is used to form planetary systems. Gas will come together, coalesce, form planets and stars. They'll go through their life cycle, either blow up in supernovas or shrink into white dwarfs, white dwarf, or uh, red dwarfs. So the idea is the material that makes up the stars and planets will be exhausted. And you can envision, you can have a little fun with this, you can envision if there's any life in the universe, which of course there won't be. They're huddled around this dim, dying red dwarf star, which is the last remnant of stars that take trillions of years to slowly burn out in a distant corner of the universe. So the death of starlight, any life remaining will huddle around a dim red dwarf star in a distant dark corner of the universe. The idea is, if you extrapolate it out, there's a built-in obsolescence to the universe. It seems as though we're destined to expand forever, expand more quickly with time, and the universe will eventually die in ice. Now, remember the beginning of this presentation. 1920s, less than 100 years ago, the conventional thinking was static eternal universe. You start talking about dynamic universe, a universe that had a beginning, people were bothered by it. What does all this mean? In the 90 year history of cosmology, we've essentially come to the conclusion that the universe had a beginning and that the universe is going to have an end. It may take a while, but it's finite. If we get to a point where we have a finite universe, people get uncomfortable because it's a lot easier to believe in an eternal universe than to believe in a finite universe. Not only that, but the universe is winding down. Second law of thermodynamics, entropy. Things become more and more random and chaotic with time. So things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. There's more divorces, there's more death, there's more crime, there's more crap. It's built into the fabric of the universe. So in conclusion, the discovery of the accelerating universe that we call dark energy, um, is necessary in order to make modern cosmo the, the modern cosmological model of the universe work. We need dark energy to explain the geometry of the universe. We still don't know what the dark energy is. And here's the bottom line. Dark energy, understanding what it is and how it behaves, is essential to bridging the gap between general relativity and quantum mechanics. These two theories by themselves work. You put them together and they hate each other. They're completely polar opposites. And that is one of the biggest puzzles in science today. They don't agree, they don't work, but we think that understanding the nature of dark energy will help us understand how general relativity and quantum mechanics can come together and actually work. And that's the foundation of something we call string theory. We'll get into that in another presentation. <laughs> anyway, that concludes my talk. I think I've probably stretched you guys enough. Um, I was certainly stretched working on this. But um, are there any questions, comments, or criticisms at this point? Here's a criticism. for me to try to have a question about that, but I would like to share something that I learned from a student. Uh, 
Uh, the <coughs> second to last time I taught astrophysical chemistry here several years ago, I had a young lady in the class who is now finishing medical school, one of the better ones in the class. And I got up to this, pretty much the same area, and I was getting to the same conclusions that you just came to. And she was looking more and more agitated and scowling, and she finally put her hand up and said, you know, the universe had a very spectacular beginning associated with let there be light, and it came out of nothing, and all of this has happened since then. I don't think God's going to let the universe just fizzle out at the end, like we were talking about there, that he probably has some kind of spectacular ending in mind as well. Now, it's totally unscientific, but so is everything before the Big Bang, and probably so is everything after whatever end it has. So that's to think of that. When you start mixing, um, this is a scientific presentation. Right, right. Yes. And as scientists, we try to um, separate the, um, the world of religion from the world of right. science. Mm -hmm. When George Lemaitre first proposed that the universe had an origin, the Pope immediately embraced Lemaitre. Because if the universe had an origin, then that could be tangible proof for a creation. And Lemaitre, who was actually a Belgian priest, had to kind of push back on the Pope and say um, that it's only a theory. It's only a scientific theory. So it doesn't prove or disprove anything. However, it's interesting, um, depending on your worldview, that when you look at the model of the Big Bang and the model of creation, there are some common denominators, there's this area of rapid inflation that's necessary in order to make the Big Bang model work. God said, let there be light, and bang, it happened right away. In one millionth of a 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 trillionth of a second, the universe just went whoosh. It's like it didn't exist and then all of a sudden it existed. And there was that area of inflation. So I'm not saying that those two equate, but it's kind of interesting that when you look at Science doesn't necessarily have to disagree with the Bible, but it doesn't necessarily, I mean, let's not even go there. Okay? Well, truths <laughs> don't conflict. If, yes, they don't conflict. <laughs> so, science is right and your religion is right, then there shouldn't be any problem. Right. The deeper you go into cosmology and the origins of the universe, if you're a rational being, you're going to start asking some pretty hard questions. Yeah. Let's just leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks. Very good. I've got something to bring up for the uh, yeah, I think it was in May, for those of you in you remember, then we had the picnic in June, so I didn't get to welcome her at the G meeting. It was a lot of ways. I was going to fix the dinner for her. And she called me yeah, from the nursing home and said, her hands are turning purple. Yeah, I'm trying to understand where. Well, so I dropped everything and went to the nursing home. And we thought she was going to die that night. She was trying to. She could tell what she was doing. She was going for it. Thanks for coming out. She ran out of energy and so I fell back and went to sleep. She slept for about three days and then died at lucky day of that. So, but when we came oh, home, when we saw that things had kind of settled down, yeah, we went really back home really about 10.30 or so. Well, so I was like, well, I'm like, so this is a refrigerator. I'm going to get a car. No, I want it tonight. So I went ahead and fixed the dinner to serve it at midnight. That's the way she is, though. The way stuff gets her down is very long. But I think it was short stuff. Totally unlike me. Thanks for coming out. Uh, it's, it's not she's not feeling or anything, but she doesn't let one area of the room sit in the house. But it would have been a mess if it had come to the symphony season. She would have had to take lots of time off and somewhere. And it just lost the second flute player anyway. Moved to Atlanta. Well, that's just as well. He was a thorn on their side. If you look at the slide, so he's gone, and they promoted the third flute to second.
So there are still uh, we got the class is covering the third part. But on the grand scale, on the large scale of the universe, if you look the at the universe, is a male, a third is a female. The galaxy is space itself the is a sort of a male. So it's expanding. It's Todd Sketch. He and Joey, the principal oboist, used to be an item on the other side of Karen. Talk back and forth across her and totally ignoring her. And then they had a falling out. Joey was the same more friendly with her, but Todd was still being an anal sphinx the whole time. So we're all glad he's gone. Atlanta, on a larger scale, you don't have to just to the 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 as the space inside the space. Good space. Yeah, yeah, he was good. He was good as a He was accurate in tune. They're next to each other. Just totally uninspired. Maybe machines that would do that. That would be nice. The way she is, and more distant puts that into the plane. Ten, 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 Oh, oh, okay. So, I only audition one of the other she auditioned further out you get two days after she had braces put all over her teeth. The best analogy I don't have talk or eat. Filipinko has a She didn't get too far with that. And she stayed with my nephew and his wife in St. Louis. They came on that this picture of the picture of Margarita said the audition was over. Because there's more yeah, rubber and right. had a sense. <laughs> totally turned her against her. But that was it. All the They're actually excelling. People are slightly in the place. Yeah, yeah. Mostly turn them down. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Everybody's all part of the recitals out of town. Yeah. 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 She's done yeah. yeah. some clusters and solos yeah. with other sure. orchestras. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 That's not what she wanted to do. This is what she wanted to do, and she's doing it. So, part of the reason. Oh, it's like moving the house. I just look forward to not doing it. You're about the only one that's on this record. Yeah, well, she just turned 61. Yeah, but <laughs> if they yeah. played just the masterworks concert, she could do that indefinitely. But they were working to death with all these little school things. They have to tell them all the time, and they go play in the Air Force. It's undignified, subtle, professional work just to use up their time instead of getting real concerts going. So, I've never grabbed I've had enough of that. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's still so early. Some <laughs> awful part of effect town. Of is negligible. Going with somebody to look over a show they're going to and from school or whatever it is. But yes, gravity is still there because the obvious stacks. So the gravitational attraction. That's a bad part of town 30 years ago. The energy of the vacuum is also expanding. Farther than the story of the universe, he was the last. He tried to throw his name out of the astronauts. He really doesn't like that. He was influenced by Grass. Right. He's a micromanager of the highest order. He has to be left every note to tell everybody what to do on every early session years ago. The way of thinking, the way to do it is to get the best musicians and come back with this, turn them loose, which is more space much do their thing. Get the general tempo and so on. Really, the bottom line is what's that? Empty flails around like there's something crazy. It has for about two thirds of the world following. 
Tahoe was one of the raised dogs in some dark matter, but she knew the number of his relationships. She got practically right out of Nashville. She was guest conducting there, and she started pulling that kind of crap with them. Concert master or the representative or something. She said, This is not a secret order, so you really need to treat us that way. Why did you get born? What's your relationship? There's always been the same proportion of what time was her born dark matter. The sheriff of the matter stood up to I can say that's for me, the sound of the symphony has improved. The universe is expanding, and as the universe uh, expands, yeah. the, influence, the influence of dark energy is not yes. increasing. Yeah. It's increasing the influence of dark energy. Yes. 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 Control of the air. Has it changed? Relative pitch. She has a tuner for the bell was so out of touch. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So the universe had a beginning. Let whatever happens happen. That was good about other extremes. Oh, yeah, it had a few frogs and stuff. As the universe expands, are you adding more energy to the system? Polar object. Yeah. Or is it like him? Dark matter is coming down. Alan Balter was the last one that I really liked. And coming from the source of the universe. Structure. Oh, yeah, it's degenerate. Sure. I think it was. And then 
Johnny Depp no, material. It wasn't a new Rock Star is Johnny Depp material. Was was a white dwarf is Johnny Depp material. I think it was. Well, with a white dwarf, I still have a structure. Yeah. 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 Well, I just read that recently. It's still remarkable. Right. 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 Right.